there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. What a powerful verse. What a powerful verse. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Let's pray and we'll talk about these two verses. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are gracious, kind, loving, you're just, you're holy, you're righteous. You are our hope. Our hope is built on you. You are the stone which the builders rejected. You came to bring us hope and give the world hope. Lord, help us to see you in this season. Help us to look for hope in you in this season. Lord, speaking of hope, I already mentioned coffee, but I was moved with hope when I got the third cup today. It was a very good cup, and it's combined two drinks that's just incredible, even better than I thought was possible. So it gave me hope that I would have the energy to preach on a cold day, Lord. Please send snow, by the way. What is a brown Christmas? Thank you for the crew winning. God, we know you are the God of miracles. The crew are amazing, and I'm sure they will play in heaven. And so thank you for that. What is a sounder anyways? No one knows. Thank you for giving the crew victory in Jesus' name. Amen. I feel like we should clap for that. That was a big deal. Columbus Crew. Two years from, from Anthony Precourt moving us away to being the champions and beating a team whose name makes no sense. I'll take it. I'll take it. Man, that was a big deal. Do you like Christmas trees? Anybody? Are y'all Christmas tree people? Half of you are. Okay, good, good. Uh, man, I love Christmas trees. I love the tradition of Christmas. I love the tradition of going and getting the Christmas tree. I love getting to pull my daughter around in the sled while we look for the Christmas tree. I love the whole process. Um, I, we grew up cutting our own tree. We grew up doing all of that. And that was like, it was not Christmas until the, like, the Christmas season officially began the day after Thanksgiving for us. We went, we cut down a tree as kids. Then we went and got Pizza Hut and we got the, the cheese filled crust. You know what I'm talking about? Cheesy crust. That was like, Man, we were like, oh, Dad must have won the lotto this week. We got that cheesy crust this time. Like, we did that every day after Thanksgiving. I have now learned why my dad immediately had to go work or do chores or whatever after bringing the tree and setting it up. Because now we have a three-year-old who helps us decorate the tree. And now I'm like, yeah, sweetheart, I got to go. <laughs> I've learned why he did that. But I love the whole process. It's fun. My grandfather, however, had a different approach to Christmas trees. I don't know if your family was like this. My grandfather waited until the day before Christmas. Christmas Eve, my grandfather would take a double-sided axe, walk out into the woods through the snow, and come back with a tree about this big that had like two branches on it. He would stick it in a white five-gallon bucket, drop it in there, put some rocks around it, and that was the Christmas tree. That was like, hey, that's good enough for you guys. And he always like, and my mom would always call it a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Now, as a kid, I watched the Charlie Brown Christmas, but I didn't put the two together until I watched Charlie Brown Christmas recently and realized that he, my mom was referencing the tree that Charlie Brown picked. So if you don't know the story of a Charlie Brown Christmas, I'm gonna fill you in. There is a reason I have this blanket, all right? It is because Linus, one of the characters, always carries his blanket with him everywhere he goes in a Charlie Brown Christmas tree, all right? In a Charlie Brown Christmas, Charlie Brown is very depressed. It's Christmas season, and he cannot figure out why he is depressed. So he goes, like all of everybody else, five-year-olds do, they go to a psychiatrist. <laughs> he went to a psychiatrist who charged him five cents. He began to unveil to the psychiatrist that he thought Christmas was too commercialized and there was too much profiting off of it. His own dog had entered a doghouse decorating contest and he began to talk to her about, man, I just think Christmas is ruined by this commercialization. And she said, you know what you need to do? You need to direct a Christmas play. So he gets very excited. He decides he's going to embrace the role as the Christmas uh, director. They begin. He gets the characters. They get lined up. 
And then as the, the play begins to unfold, he begins to be more and more and more upset about what's going on with Christmas. So finally, the girl, the psychiatrist tells him, just go cut down a tree and I'll take care of these guys. He goes and cuts down a tree. And then his tree looks like the tree that my grandfather would bring home and stick in a white five gallon bucket. It is this tree that just kind of looks rather hopeless. Everyone then begins to mock him and make fun of him because of his choice in a tree. And we'll pick that story up in a minute. But if you think about it, the entire story of the birth of Jesus is full of Charlie Brown Christmas trees for characters. Just think about the genealogy of Jesus. There is murderers, there is affairs, there is prostitutes, there is liars, there is thieves. That's who he's descended from. And then according to Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1, the stump, his, the, the genealogy, the line that Jesus is supposed to descend from is cut off and made into a stump. It is removed. So you've got this, this family history of just rough, Charlie Brown type characters, and then the tree gets cut off and it's just turned into this little hopeless stump. Even the list of people who hear about his birth. You have some highly educated people from the Far East. You have some shepherds who are considered the unclean of their society, not allowed to enter the temple. You have a priest. You have an elderly lady who is barren and far past her years of giving birth, and a teenage girl who is engaged to a guy who should have been a king, but lost his kingdom, so he built shelves for Ikea. That is the characters. It's like a Charlie Brown Christmas. You just throw all these odd characters in a room, and then if that's not enough, Jesus, the great king, our God, our Savior, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the great I am the way, has to come and be born in this dirty little town called Bethlehem that nobody wants to go to. And even in the town of Bethlehem that nobody was wanting to go to, there wasn't a place for him to be born. So they had to put him in a barn in a manger. It would seem like this story has no hope at all. And yet, Hope comes out of that major. Hope arises from a tree that's cut down to a stump with a whole bunch of odd characters in a place that no one would expect the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, to be born. Jesus gives us hope. The manger gives us hope. Christmas gives us hope. Hope is an interesting word. I hoped that the crew would win versus the Seattle Sounders. I hoped that, right? Like we were like, yeah, let's, let's hope they win. But that's not the definition of the biblical view of hope. The biblical view of hope is so much more. It means something that comes from hard and difficult days. The biblical idea of hope is when it seems like there is no hope at all, that's when God does something and that's when we find hope. Hope arrives in the middle of hopeless situations. Hope arrives in the middle of a pandemic. Hope for your marriage exists in the middle of the hardest year for marriages. Hope for your relationships exists in the middle of a year when depression and domestic abuse are at all-time high. Hope exists in the middle of that. That's where hope is found. Even better, hope arrives when your enemy is taking your kingdom from you and giving it to someone else, so now you're a carpenter and your teenage girlfriend is pregnant and no one will let you stay at their place to have your baby. That's where hope is found. Christmas brings us hope and it gives us hope and Christmas comes, this hope comes from difficult, dark, hard times. You ever wonder why? Like if I was, if I was Jesus, and I'm certainly not, but if I was Jesus, I would say, hey, hey, uh, Father, like, I can still save the world and arrive when Solomon rules, right? Like when, when David's got everything and the temple's huge and it's beautiful and there's so much gold that we just start making shields out of it. There's so much silver that we just start lining our stables for our horses with silver. Like I can go and save the world at that point, right? But God, Jesus decides to arrive when the Romans are ruling. You ever read about the Romans? They are ruthless. If you think this last political year was rough, try living in Roman days. 
Where if you were related to someone who might be a threat, they just killed you and threw you off cliffs, fed you to animals. Those times were hard. The greatest story of hope ever found arrived in that time. And there's Joseph, who should be the king of Israel. His line is cut off. It's now a stump. He seems to have no hope. He can't even give his wife a place to have her baby. And the branch shoots forth out of the stump in the hardest, most difficult time in their history. See, God showed us that Jesus was born in a hopeless, difficult, dark time to give us hope in our dark, difficult times. Because of the manger, you can have hope for your relationships. Because of the manger, that relationship that you thought was hopeless now has hope. Because of the manger, the job that you thought was just, I need to just give up, now has hope. Because of the manger, that family member who you said, you know what, we're just going to give up on them, now has hope. Because of the manger, no matter what sins you are sinning, no matter how dark your day may be, there is hope. Because of the manger, no matter how difficult your addiction may be to conquer, there is hope. And God came in the middle of the most hopeless hour, the most hopeless time in history to show us that he can bring forth hope out of dark, difficult times. He came to show us that there is hope in what seemingly is hopeless times so that you can have hope in your difficult time. I feel like someone should clap for that. That's good. That's good. The manger gives us hope. The manger shows us that there is hope in a cattle trough. God had to show us that no thing is impossible with him. So he could have the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the great, the word, the living word could bring hope from a cattle trough in a borrowed place, in borrowed clothes. And yet God brought that. And so Christmas changes our question then from what if to why not? If there's hope, why do we spend all of our time asking, well, what if? If there's really hope, why don't you start asking, why not? Well, what if I get rejected when I ask her? Well, why not ask and find out? Well, what if I apply for my dream job and don't get it? Well, why not ask and find out? Well, what if we can't do this? Well, why not try and find out? Hope changes that. The Christmas season changes our question. When we have the hope of God, when we realize that because of God, nothing is impossible, we begin to say, why not start a church in Westerville where church plants go to die? Why not do CrossFit with people and start sharing the gospel? And when that happens, why not start sharing the gospel with kids who come here and get baptized? Why not share the gospel with people in the short north who, who have a hair salon and bring all, can drive all the way up here to get baptized? Why not baptize people in the river? Why not set up a kid's church in a hopeless-looking situation with little gates around them to keep them safe? Why not try to have church in an impossible situation in the middle of a pandemic? Why not? Because we have hope, so we stop asking what if, and we start saying why not? That's what hope does. But secondly, hope changes our viewpoint. It changes our viewpoint. If you look at Psalm chapter 121, this is like an amazing chapter. It says, I will lift up my eyes into the hills, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He will preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Look at the beginning of that chapter again. I, uh, Psalm chapter 121, verse 1. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. Now, I used to think that that meant that he was looking for Jesus to come over the hill and rescue him. Because I watched Lord of the Rings, and Gandalf of the Grey always said, look for me on the morning of the third day. That's what I thought was happening. Like, I pictured myself in Lord of the Rings and looking at the hill like, oh, God, you better come over this. I've seen Gandalf do this. It's supposed to be a picture of you. So that's not what this passage means. This is called a psalm of ascent. They're supposed to sing it as they ascend up a place. They're going up into the temple. They are ascending. 
Do you know what he's saying? I'm going to keep my eyes looking up even though I'm at the bottom. You might feel like you're at the bottom right now. It's 2020 and the weirdest year ever, but keep your eyes up. Change your viewpoint from all around you, what's happening around you, political things, issues, all these different, now we're going to have fights for two years about vaccines coming up. Now we got this about this, and we got this about this. Change your eyes from looking around you to looking up, because that's where you're going. That's where we're moving. We're moving up. We're ascending. We might feel like we're at the bottom, but Christmas changes our view, because hope says, I'm going to look up. That's where I'm going. My grandma used to weed a garden. She would never spend time looking back to see how, much she, how far she'd come. She would look where she was going. She would look ahead. We have hope. We have got to change our viewpoint as believers from being so consumed with, oh, what's this, what's this, what's going on around me, what's going on, what's happening here, this anxiety-riddled world should see believers whose eyes are fixed on heaven. Our help comes from Him. Our hope is found in Him. But thirdly, and this is why I'm carrying this blanket, Christmas changes a lot of things and it causes us to drop our security blankets. I don't know how much you know about this story, all right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish the, the story of a Charlie Brown Christmas. Charlie Brown brings in the Christmas tree. And everyone starts making fun of him. And everyone starts mocking him. And everyone starts laughing at him because of his tree. And Charlie Brown utters the words, doesn't anybody know what Christmas actually means? And Linus, who carries this little blanket with him through the entire movie, there it is. Linus has this blue blanket everywhere Linus goes. In this movie, Linus is quoted repeatedly for telling people he will never drop his blanket. In fact, uh, the psychiatrist says to him, what are you gonna do when you get older? And he says, I'm gonna turn my blanket into a sport coat. <laughs> they tell him he can't be a shepherd if he wants to carry his blanket, or an angel if he wants to carry his blanket. He says, I'll be the first one that ever did. He will not drop his blanket. However, Charlie Brown yells out, doesn't anybody know the meaning of Christmas anymore? And Linus says to him, sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. He then walks to center stage and he says, lights, please. You've all seen it. It's 55 years old. I hope you've seen it. He then says something. He quotes Luke chapter 2. We're going to read those verses for you. Luke chapter 2, verses 8. There were in the same country shepherds abiding in their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, if you just hear me read it, it's not the same. But I want to show you a picture of what Charlie Brown's friend Linus does when he says the words, fear not. Can we show that picture? Look at what Charlie happened to Linus' blanket. When Linus says fear not, he literally drops his blanket on the ground. Now this is a 55 year old movie and I'm approaching that age and I've seen this a whole bunch of times and I never ever even noticed what he does. But there's an entire story about the man who wrote this. And the man who wrote this had to fight CBS to be able to put this scene in the show that was aired on CBS. So much so that he said, if you don't let me do this, I'm going to get rid of it. And the whole reason he wanted it in there was because he wanted Linus to drop his blanket when he said, fear not. And he wanted us to see that a child realizes that when they put their trust in God, they don't have to trust in their security blankets anymore. When we put our hope in God, we don't have to trust in the things that we cling to for hope in this current world. He realized, my hope is not built on finances. Drop that. My hope is not built on people. Drop that. If your hope is built on a relationship, drop it. If your hope is built on a pastor, drop it. I 
one will disappoint you. Jesus never will. So drop the security blankets. If your hope is built on being healthy, now would be a good time to find hope in Jesus. If your hope is built on science, if your hope is built on medicine, if your hope is built on politics, drop it. If your hope is built on America, drop it. If your hope is built on friendships, drop it. If your hope is built on anything but Jesus, drop the blanket. The author of Charlie Brown Christmas had Linus, a child, teach us that when we put our hope in Christ, we don't have to cling to all these other things forever. When we put our hope in Him, we don't have to cling. Well, I just don't know what I would do. I don't know how to handle this. Cling to Jesus. Look at, look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order and to establish it with justice and just, uh, judgment from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Did you see the words in there? His government, his rulership, his leadership, our hope is built on him and he will never leave us. He establishes it forever. There is no end to his kingdom. So political systems come and go, but Jesus never does. Boyfriends and girlfriends come and go, Jesus never does. Bills come and go. Jesus never does. Houses come and go. Jesus never does. Education comes and goes. Jesus never does. So put your hope in him today. Christmas came to remind us that our hope is in Christ. We're going to do stuff different today. This is a different day, all right? We're going to, we're going to ask you to stand and sing a song with us. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here. We're going to actually sing it. We're going to do the, uh, a little short video, and then we're going to sing it again. It's a little different. But there's a song that says like this, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean in Jesus' name. And we hear that, and we sing it, but we don't believe it all the time. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to ask you to sing with us. I'm going to ask you to sing it like you believe it. I told Cam, I was like, don't let the worship team come up if they're just going to stand there and sing. I want them to sing like they believe this. I want them to sing with all of their hope being in Jesus. I want you to sing with your hope in Christ. Our hope is built on nothing less. Every blanket that you have, everything that you're clinging to, your security blankets, if it's family, if it's being the coolest family on Instagram, if it's your job, if it's your education, your future, whatever it is, drop it. In this moment, choose to give it up and put your hope in Christ. If your hope is built on being a good person, drop it and sing this song like you truly believe it. Sing it with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might, with our worship team.